Welcome back to UFO PM. I'm your host, John Kelly. Tonight we have a very special guest featuring Stranger at the Pentagon with filmmaker Craig Campobasso. Fresh out of high school, California native Craig Campobasso found himself working behind the scenes for four years on Frank Herbert's Dune. The father and daughter production team, Dino and Rafaela De Laurentiis, and director David Lynch were Craig's mentors into the business of filmmaking. Rafaela later hired him on the popular Christmas movie Prancer, starring Sam Elliott, as a casting director after he apprenticed as a casting associate on Steven Spielberg's Amazing Stories. Craig has been casting for more than two decades and was nominated for an Emmy for casting David E. Kelly's Picket Fences. Some of his credits include Sky Captain and the World of Tomorrow, starring Jude Law and Angelina Jolie, The Godson, starring Don DeLuise, Screw Loose, starring Mel Brooks, Red Line, starring Eddie Griffin, Tremors 3, starring Michael Gross, and most recently, both The Perfect Host, starring David Hyde Pierce, and Hell and Mr. Fudge, starring Mackenzie Aston and Carrie Lynn Pratt. Craig just finished casting Golden Shoes, a kid's soccer movie, starring Dina Meyer, Vivica A. Fox, John Reese davies Montel Williams, and Mary Wilson from The Supremes. Starbright, a fantasy film, and The Kiss, a psychological horror suspense film. Craig's other current casting projects include Awakeners, Dragon's Bow, Galaxy Watch, The Galactarian Legacy, Miracle at Gate 213, and Deep Screams. Craig is also producing, directing, and casting his short film, Stranger at the Pentagon, which we'll be speaking about tonight, based on the book, now and now in post-production, and it's the launching pad for a feature-length film. You can learn more about Craig Campobasso by visiting craigcampobasso.com or in the IMDb database. He's on Facebook and the website for strangeratthePentagon.com. Craig, thank you so much for being here tonight. It's great to see you. And nice to see you too, John. Well, the story behind this project, uh, Stranger at the Pentagon, uh, runs deep, and there's a, there's a lot of legacy. There's a book by Dr. Frankie Strange's. There's even commentary by uh, Harley Bird, uh, who was with Project Blue Book, who states that the landing of Valiant Thor was perhaps the first documented landing of a human-type alien by military officials. He says that he met with President Eisenhower and v Vice President Richard Nixon for an hour, then the alien was put on VIP status and shuttled back to the Pentagon. Well, Paul Hellyer, the Canadian former uh, Minister of Defense, says that the U.S. government has been working with extraterrestrials. Tell us more about Commander Valiant Thorin. Where does he come from? Well, the story actually begins on um, March 6th. It was a Saturday, March 16th, 1957. Uh, Valiant Thor came. It was a Saturday morning at 8 a.m. Uh, his craft came in, landed in Alexandria, Virginia, in an agricultural field. Um, there were calls in to the uh, police station. A uh, police car immediately met met the craft, and when the, a man walked out, who was Valiant Thor, um, the minute that the police officer saw him, they literally just dropped their hands because uh, they just saw that this man was emanating with love. He, he had an angelic quality to him. Um, they had a conversation. They took them directly to the Pentagon, where and you have to remember it was a Saturday morning. All these people were being called in uh, to work. So uh, but while he was being transported, um, the Secretary of Defense was being called in, where he met with him, and then later on met with uh, President Eisenhower, Vice President uh, Richard Nixon, and it was also. Uh, Pat Nixon's birthday that day as well, so he was a little bit late. So they had a conversation. Everybody felt this angelic quality coming from him. And um, Valiant Thor came with a, what, what we call a divine design to help eliminate sickness, disease, prolong life, um, eliminate poverty. Um, and he asked uh, President Eisenhower to implement it throughout the United States and then throughout the world. Uh, so Eisenhower actually put him on VIP status for three years to go, you know, to not only go over that proposal and discuss the implications, but, um, you know, to also uh, be there and work with uh, the government. So, so we're talking about extraterrestrials at the Pentagon, liaisons, consulting, and. Yeah. And, but but these are not just it's not it's not it's not, as you're expressing clearly it's not just their physical nature as ETs but it's this presence that they're manifesting these are people 
personalities with higher spiritual qualities. Yes, and you know, um, I think the the difference between uh, you know, we, I always say to extraterrestrials, we're extraterrestrials because we're from somewhere else. So, um, but Valiant Thor, I think, comes under a different classification. You know, there's extraterrestrials. There, what we would deem. They're all hu human appearing that are on his immediate crew, um, all, except for one is um, uh, one of the commanders is actually a cyclops of all things. Not a lot of people know that that they supposedly exist. So, all right. Um, although I've never seen one, but Dr. Frank said that when he did when he did meet this man for the first time, he said inside his head, "Oh my God, you are one weird looking guy." <laughs> and and the gentleman looked back at him and he goes, "Well, you're pretty weird looking too," because of course he read his thoughts. So, uh, but the, the man did have a very funny saying, which uh, is also incorporated into the script, which is he always said, "I have my eye on you." <laughs> you no, know, this takes yeah. this takes us into an area of discussion where people talk about Nordic extraterrestrials and uh, the. Persons with a, a Northern European uh, appearance, uh, blonde hair. Uh, when we think about some of the different uh, testimonies given over previous decades, uh, George Adamski spoke yes. about blonde-haired ETs. Uh, Billy Meyer spoke famously about different blonde-haired ETs. And so, this is a culture. There was a cultural understanding, or is, is, there's been a, a seeding of our of our understanding over many decades about human-like ETs, but they are different from us in, in terms of they manifest maybe high, higher consciousness abilities, telepathy, or insight and wisdom uh, uh, that, that, that shows evidence for uh, further evolution. It, it, in some ways, I, I guess it suggests that there's a promise for us, you know, our, our human struggles and difficulties are, are sort of uh, lower pursuits, perhaps absorbing us too much. There's also a potential that we could grow to be uh, you know, higher, higher st stewards of the of the earth and participants in a higher type of civilization as well. Right. Well, they uh, uh, they're what we would call fully conscious beings. Their their heart actually rules their mind. So they work for the good of all universal kind, not just mankind, but all universal kind. So um, Valiant Thor, then we would we would think of as being as being more angelic because he's a created being, which is what we would deem as an angel in human form. So uh, he doesn't have a belly button. He doesn't have fingerprints, palm prints. Um, and Dr. Frank said his, uh, uh, when he first met him, he could feel him look through his eyes into his soul, and he could feel every, he knew everything about him in an instant. Well, this is very compelling. You know, I, I think there was a lot of skepticism in the past surrounding contactees who, who spoke about these kinds of contacts, but we find in the present day that uh, this type of telepathy and indications of higher consciousness accompany hard, solid evidence of, of video recordings, uh, people who have precognitive dreams that tell them to set up their cameras to record UFOs and, and so on. Yes. There's these demonstrations of higher consciousness. So to turn the tables on the skeptics, it almost seems as if the more uh, the more of this type of consciousness-related uh, evidence appears, the more likely it appears to, that these 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 are authentic cases. Yeah, yeah, and it's it's happening, you know, more and more. Just since I started this project, um, I've been getting so many calls uh, from people all around the world writing me, telling me, you know, their stories from the time they were a child when they saw a UFO or they had experiences with you know human human type beings in their dream states or they saw them or they saw them you know in various situations um, uh, and or they email me these as well um, which I just find fascinating and now even people I work with in the film business a director called me recently that I worked with and said that he saw uh, on two consecutive days while shooting down in Hollywood a gigantic cylindrical spaceship just hovering there in, in midair and he actually filmed it with his phone that's stunning uh, is this, yeah. this is, so, so something, something is yeah. happening something powerful is yeah. happening in our society now Hollywood has been criticized 
by p people in the UFO community about um, making too many scary monster films about invaders from outer space. <laughs> now, yeah. Stranger at the Pentagon is a little different, isn't that right? It's a little different. It's actually a spiritual story. So, um, you know, I think it'll be actually kind of cool. So it's it's for all the Star Trek, you know, Star Wars kind of fans, but with the thread of the spirituality going through it because you're actually getting to know the consciousness of these beings who are coming from somewhere else, who are coming here to help. And what that conflict is also for them within themselves on how to deal with situations with dualistic beings as opposed to fully conscious beings. Do you know, so. Tell, tell us more about your personal history with Dr. Strange, how you met him and how you, you started to appreciate his work. You know, I read his book, uh, I read Stranger at the Pentagon in the 80s and then... Um, uh, I met him in 2001, my casting partner at the time, who's since retired. She had uh, two friends who were married, um, a much older couple, um, who uh, uh, she said that they they saw, they live in Arizona, and they she said they see flying saucers all the time. So she wanted me to meet them, and uh, the wife said to me, you know, in like the first or second second uh, sentence, she said, well, you know our friend, Dr. Frank, and I went, strangers? And she said, yes, and I said, and then she looked at me and she goes, well, you want to meet him? And I said, yes, and two days later I was sitting having lunch with Dr. Frank and found out that the whole time I was growing up as a teenager, he lived not but five minutes from my house. Well. So, yeah, so uh, anyway, the lo long story short is I became instant friends with him and... Uh, he called me up uh, one day and said somebody wanted to make the book into a movie and he didn't know of those things, would I go with them? I did. Um, I told him this was not the person he wanted to get involved with. Um, and I actually, uh, I actually, um, uh, you know, he, it's, it was so difficult because he literally cried. You know, I mean, he was so, um, you know, he was so upset that, that it, you know, the dream was crushed in that moment. So, so I just started saying little by little, well, let's just see how it goes. Let's, let me try and work something. And, you know, and as we started going and going and going, then I ended up writing the script and then I wrote a full, the full length feature. Um, and sat with him for several years just going over all kinds of stories because, you know, he went to the, uh, Victor One Balthor's craft for, uh, you know, from the first time was 1968 all the way up until his death in 2008. And so to hear all his stories and interactions with all the crew members and, you know, various stories there, um, and then, uh, and then I just woke up one morning and I went, you know, this was after Dr. Frank's passing. And um, I said, you know what? When I, when I worked on Sky Captain in the World of Tomorrow, that, they created, that, that director, writer, created a short film. It was, that film got made because there was a short film. So you can go and you can have a movie pitch and you can talk to people about it. But unless they see it, even George Lucas, when he did Star Wars, the 20th century execs could not get what he was doing. He literally back then had to have airbrush artists come in and make giant uh, paintings of what he was actually trying to convey, and that's how they actually greenlit the movie. Um, so anyway, so I woke up and said, well, I'm going to make a short film, and did a little fundraising campaign, called in a million favors from producers and everybody, and uh, we got James Cameron's visual effects coordinator, who I actually spoke to on the phone today. He was there with us, and we've got, you know, giant uh, uh, CG animators who do, you know, have done everything from Titanic to Avatar to the latest one coming out is um, White House Down. And you know, with Jamie Foxx and uh, Channing Tatum. 
Well, the, the look that you've achieved with this film so far, just from what's been released, is stunning and evocative. Yeah. And uh, yeah. I, I think it's, you know, it, it says it says a great Thank deal you. about Thank the you. skills and professionalism that you've brought with your team. Yes, and we all we uh, another really kind of cool tidbit is, you know, um, I said we can't do we can't make a movie unless we actually have really cool spacesuits, you know. So, um, <laughs> so. I uh, I had a, a designer design them, and then um, I called up my friend Jim Levy over at he owns Eastern Costume, and I said, Jim, you got to do me a favor. So uh, anyway, he uh, you know we got all our costumes, we got everything from him, and he had his master tailors actually build the uniforms for us from the actual drawings, and. Um, and his master tailor, uh, Gilberto Guzman, uh, I found out after the fact, and I've known Gilberto for many, many years, uh, he's the man who designed the very first Star Trek uniforms for their first movies. Holy cow. Not designed them, he built them. That's what I meant. Oh, so, uh, yeah, so he built ours as well. So I thought that was a very cool kind of, you know, omen. <laughs> I, I have to say, I mean, you, could, you couldn't have picked better people uh, to work with yeah. and had, had access to better resources, it seems. Yeah, yeah. And all of that, by the way, everybody who's listening, you can just, you know, go to strangerathepentagon.com and, uh, you know, you can go through the whole website and find everything there. One of the things I'm gathering from our conversation is this is really, although it's at the sh still at the short film development stage or uh, proposal stage, uh, this yeah, is yeah. a multi-year development. Your, your, your dialogues with Dr. Frank took place over many years just yeah. to, to cultivate a vision of what, what the short film or the feature film would look like. Yes, yes. Yeah, and, you know, and it will, um, by the way, there are going to be a couple of money shots like you can't believe. I mean, that's, the CG animators came on board because I actually had these um, design, you know, I designed it myself with an artist, and she came in and drew it, painted it, and did the whole thing. And um, just on the landing bay alone, which is, like, majorly spectacular because, we're going to be actually showing the very first Merkaba vehicles hmm. on um, screen, which are vehicles of light that master teachers travel in. Hmm. You know, they're they're made up of um, they're you know they're made up of special, special energies and and things like that. And they were so excited just off the visuals, they accepted the job just by seeing just you know the drawings and the paintings. So you really you are really bringing these uh, sort of higher dimensional, higher consciousness elements to the film. This isn't just yes. about traveling faster than the speed of light. This is that's right. Uh -huh. That's right. Yeah, it's bringing all of these visuals that people have never seen, but then also bringing the spirituality, you know, uh, into it because you know you have to realize um, if you're a, a created being or you're even a, a, a an extraterrestrial with full consciousness and you're like, let's say they were interacting with the government at that period of time, and they wanted, you know, the government wanted their technology, right? And they knew every step of what they were going to do before they did it because they know those things. So then how would, you know, they would have to figure out how they were going to react to not insult somebody or to... However, and then a lot of times, I think you know, in their own in their own way, prayed that they wouldn't go through with something that you know that somebody would do, you know, to get what they wanted. Well, there are powerful issues related to control and volition yeah. and free will right. that, I, that I think these encounters would bring up, uh, as you yeah. said, uh, being yes. in the, being in the presence of someone who has uh, such expanded vision, who has such forethought. We might like to believe that we're in charge, uh, but uh, right. <laughs> <laughs> but in the greater scheme of things, they know they know with we, each outcome what with each choice what the outcome will be. Hmm. Well, talk talk to me more about the, the the spiritual philosophy of Valiant Thor and and what maybe kinds of values he was trying to bring into our culture at that time. Well, I think, you know, the uh, to sort of explain it in a, in a small nutshell is um, here on Earth, you know, we're dualistic. So we're always, our light and our dark are always fighting, you know, to win. 
And in their world, they have taken that light and dark and they've merged it. They've become one with, you know, the universe, if you want to call it that. So, um, so the, the teachings and the philosophy is why the dual mind was created as the teacher as well as we're all here sort of learning on this world how to be God beings, if you will. Do you know? Because we're all going to attain we're all going to attain universal greatness throughout our journey as a soul um, and attain anything that we set our minds to, you know, throughout the universe in our in our universal schooling. So um, you know, so this is a school of learning about that duality and how our thoughts affect everything that we do. So if we have, if we are working and we are manipulating situations to our advantage, then we're just going to keep keep ourselves in that pattern and in that sort of wheel of karma, as you will, that that will keep perpetuating the same experience over and over and over again until we decide to climb out of that water. It's like a bad relationship, you know. Can can you speak from your experience in the film industry, your perspectives on the influence of thought and mind on on outcomes in in motion picture arts and sciences? Have you do you see this on an everyday basis in in your life? Do you know I I I am so thrilled to say that there's so many more awake people in the film business now, and a lot of people have projects like like Stranger at the Pentagon or other projects as well. Um, that that have spiritual messages and things like that, and it's like um, when one hits, whether it's Stranger at the Pentagon or or another one, all it takes is one successful one to hit, and then Hollywood will go, well, what else does that anybody have? And then all of the it'll start a a domino effect for all these people who have all these great projects and have great spiritual messages you know, um, and, and philosophies. You know, movies are the great teachers of the world. You know, we learn through movies. You know, people people learned about just the universe, the, uh, like the universal force just from Star Wars. I can't tell you how many people went, were catapulted into spirituality that I talked to because they had never thought about this light and dark force in the universe. And even though it was a very fun serial, you know, um, George Lucas was very close to Joseph Campbell, who was just brilliant, and, and Joseph Campbell taught him a lot of these, um, you know, teachings, and, uh, and we see those in Luke Skywalker and the rest of them. I mean, you know, George Lucas did a brilliant job putting all that, you know, all of the, those the first three stories together were just, you know, amazing uh, of the rise and fall you know everything is a messiah story you know really when you look at it even narnia you know the lion so the the, the journey of the soul that's right that's right well there's no doubt that film is is incredibly influential worldwide and uh there are so many ideas being expressed but what i'm hearing you say is that there is this emerging trend that stranger the pentagon is part of this uh, uh, trend that's coming up on the radar yeah. now of filmmakers focusing on high spiritual ideals and with commercial success and support of the public yeah. we could yeah. see a reversal in some trends where this becomes more of a dominant uh, theme in, in filmmaking. Yes, and, and the great thing now is because of the internet and because of um, source funding and all of that, you know, we've just had two major um, incredible things happen. Veronica Mars went on Kickstarter to make a feature film with Kristen, you know, Kristen Bell and the rest of the cast touting it, and they made uh, uh, unprecedented over three and a half million dollars for their budget. Zach Braff just did it. So when the, all these spiritual things are happening, people, the, the same with Sirius, you know, that that was also fun sourced, and it was um, everybody all over the world donated to that one to make sure that that happens. So when the public starts getting involved, you know, Hollywood actually starts to take notice. Well, as you say, it's a, it's a, it's a very powerful indicator that there is public yeah, yeah. demand for this kind of material. That's right, yeah, yeah. Well, let's go back to some of the core themes in Stranger at the Pentagon. Uh, we've talked a little bit about Valiant Thor. You, you said that he's a created being. He doesn't have fingerprints. Yeah, yeah. He doesn't have a belly button. 
How, are creative beings born of a mother and father? Where do they come from? No, I know. I asked that question, too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they're actually born, if you sort of think of it, they're, they're born from the Godhead or the Universal Head, whatever you want to call it. And they can either be born as an adult, fully conscious, and go right into their mission, or they can be born as an infant and then given to celestial parents to raise um, to raise them in the course that will set them on their mission. So these are cosmic so, manifestations, so to speak. They are cosmic manifestations, and if you want to think of it uh, as coming from a womb of light, you know, you can think of it in that respect. Now, what, what about uh, you know social order and political hierarchy? Was Valiant Thor on a mission that he was he was sent by some superiors, or what was the sort of the command structure that backed him up? Well, the you know, the, I don't know the entire structure, but uh, <laughs> starting from the top. But but <laughs> you know, one would assume that a universal sovereign sent him on the mission. Actually, all all the angelic kingdom are sent on missions, and uh, the the little bit that Doctor Frank knew about that is that um, he wanted to come here and start this mission so bad that he, he knew that he was going to be appointed this mission. But there was a long span of years before the mission actually came to fruition, before he actually came here. So there was many, many years, and I'm not sure exact of the exact span of time, but Dr. Frank said that he had told him that he literally... Um, towards the end was climbing the walls he wanted to start so bad and you sort of think you know you wonder if if you know uh, uh, anybody like like if I knew that I was gonna get to go and work on a movie with Steven Spielberg my idol and Tom Hanks my favorite actor but it wasn't for five years from now right I would be very very excited but in that last year I'd be like oh my god could I, I want come on let's go I want to say it's like you know when you're a kid and you want to go to Disneyland you know it's like that kind of feeling and um, so when he got here he was so happy to come here and to be here and maybe that's all part of how it was set up that way you know that's that's the way I think of it Yes, and so w one of the concepts that I hear you relating is is that in the the nature of the extraterrestrial encounter is is wed to the concept of the angelic, and and the underst our understanding of the, of the angelic is uh, mostly informed by religious teachings from various uh, histories. Uh, there's you know B Buddhist and tantric devas in, in Asia, as well as you know the the Western and Middle Eastern concept of Michael and, and Gabriel and so on. Yes, yeah. So when you look back with your understanding of, of Dr. Frank Strange's about Valiant Thor and your present work with the film community, when you look back now at those histories in Ezekiel's Wheel and the, you know the angels who visited the people of the past, do you think of them in terms of extraterrestrial uh, potential as well? Well, I think you know we look at them as extraterrestrials, but if you actually were putting them in a category you know, then you, would you put Buddha, Christ, Muhammad, would you put all of them in an extraterrestrial category knowing that they didn't come from here either, right? So, so I, you know, I, I would, I would put Valiant Thor in, in Angelic Kingdom in the Angelic, in the Angelic Kingdom, but I would also, the extraterrestrials or um, that, you know, who are fully conscious, um, you know, they're more what I call in the uh, Galactarian alignment of space peoples and planet because it's an alignment of consciousness. They are all aligned to source. They are all aligned to the perfect harmony of the universe because they're uh, being, again, fully conscious, having, having their heart work in union with their mind instead of being opposed, you know. So... Uh, so all the thing with the dual mind of greed and jealousy and lust and all of those things, you know, which are the, are the teachers that help, you know, each lesson you learn, you 
keep going up a notch and up a notch and up a notch until you get to the point where they marry. You know, your light and dark marries, and then you become fully conscious and you understand all the learning that you have gone through. Being, you know, being uh, in this uh, dual dual place here that we that we all experience on Earth. To tell me your thoughts on on uh, the idea of consciousnesses who incarnate on different planets and different civilizations, who appear as humans and appear uh, uh, in, as members of other civilizations as well. Do you see that as as part of a part of that scheme of things? Yes, I do. I I really do think. Um, you know that beings from elsewhere who are, uh, you know, uh, who are enlightened do come in and they they incarnate on planets and and they actually help raise consciousness. And uh, you know, humanity just needs to be reminded of their own divinity. Uh, and when you're reminded, you know, when you have these great teachers coming in, you know, we we see. Um, you know, we start to uh, understand that that we can achieve that ourselves. You know, so yeah, I real I really and truly believe that. You know, and I believe there are many many um, people from around this universe and other universes who are here. This is a major place right now on Earth where consciousness is being raised, and it's also being raised by people who are coming here from other places to incarnate in because they've already gone through the dualistic things so they can quicken their duality by incarnating here and to become fully conscious quicker so that each time everybody raises up it keeps bumping up the consciousness I mean look how much we've grown since the 70s alone you know as, well, the, spiritually. The, pace, the, the pace of change in our culture as you said yeah. and the appearance of the uh, of the the star seeds, the uh, crystal, yeah. children, this this kind of trend. Yes. Yes. Yeah, and the and the children coming in now, you know, you you know, I I of course I you know I cast movies, so I see lots of people all the time, and when I even am interviewing children, I mean, they're so brilliant and so bright. There's even you know some children just start talking about the universe, and you know, I had this conversation with this. He was not, I, I think he was about nine years old. He just started talking to me and, uh, and he said, oh, I looked you up on the internet. I see you like UFOs. You know, I love UFOs and I'm this and I'm that. And he started, he told me his whole philosophy of the universe. And I mean, just, it was mind blowing to hear, you know, all these kids these days who just are coming in so brilliant and bright and all with with um, such a love that you can't believe, you know, um, talking about God at small ages and and um, one girl was seven years old and she looked at me and she says, you know, Craig, she said, you know, we're all God. I'm God. You're God. We're all God. Everybody's God. And I looked at her mother and I said, did you teach her? And she goes, I don't know where that came from. That did not come from <laughs> us. <laughs> but I just thought, you know, it's amazing how brilliant and bright and, you know. So with, with each decade as the consciousness rises, it allows even these new incarnations of people coming in um, to come in even with a stronger fold of, of a spiritual mass. Well, that gives me great optimism to hear you say that as you're on the front yeah. line and, and you are you're yeah. uh, getting face to face time with these young talents. They're showing yeah. these gifts. Yes, yes, and, and remember when they're becoming actor, when they're actors, even at that young age. Um, you know, uh, the first time I met Dakota Fanning, she was just before I Am Sam. I was doing an HBO movie, and I said, my that I said that is the oldest soul inside of a little girl's body I had ever experienced. She was brilliant and bright, and and she was articulate. And after her reading, she looked at me and said, you know, Mr. Campobasso, do I have the part? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, well, we have to see other people, and blah blah. She goes, okay, you know. But I mean, I will just never ever. You know, ever forget that, but um, but kids who are coming in, even like these brilliant kids that I'm seeing who are actors, you know, they're what why they're making this choice is because they can be seen on screen and they can transmute those energies 
through their performances so that people can actually get it on a much deeper level when they're watching the movies. That's why I say, you know, movies are such great teachers. So, the, 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 as you say, they're human vehicles for higher energies. That's right. That's right. And which will start to come. You know, there, we're always going to have the shoot 'em up aliens are coming to eat us, you know. What's life without a little adventure, right? Right. You know, those kinds of things, you know. Or, uh, but, but they're not always the case, you know. Steven Spielberg made two wonderful movies, E.T. and Close Encounters. So that, that was more, you know, about the magic of it. The magic, exactly. Yeah. Um, this, just, just going back to look at some of the other characteristics of the film, we, we, we're talking about life on other planets, we're talking about religious or spiritual philosophy and the order of the universe, uh, you know, that y there, is a, there is a God, a creator, a creator being behind all of this, and this is well, in the film. I, you know, my, I mean, my, my own philosophy is that, you know, it's, you can call the creation, creation, God, whatever you want to call it, but everything in it is what's generating it. So everything that you and I do sets something in motion that is constantly creating, right? So whether it's good or bad, we're responsible for it. So we have to actually own up to our own things. So that's why when you become fully conscious, you see in making all the right choices just creates some um, symbiotic harmony between all beings. Um, and, and the other one thing that Dr. Fang really expresses, when you first lay eyes on these beings that they send you just from the look in their eyes so much love because they have so much love in their heart that you actually start to physically weep and weep and weep and weep because it, you know, their, their energy and even Valiant Thor, even when um, uh, you know, Sai Baba was on the planet. Many people uh, wept when they laid eyes upon him. I, I did one movie with a very famous movie star and, and said to him, I said, I don't know why I keep getting the message you're supposed to go to India and see Sai Baba. He said, you are the fifth person to tell me that in two weeks. And I went, wow, then you got to go. He actually went and when he and his family all came back, they said, they just wept and wept and wept, you know, because you see the spiritual beauty, the spiritual luminescence. So this is this concept of the darshan or the transmission? Yes, the darshan, absolutely, transmission, that's right. And, and as you're expressing, the cinema can be a vehicle for that as well. Absolutely, absolutely, and that's why when these beings coming in more and more and more, you know, um, and actors, you know, um, uh, that transmutes through the screen to everybody on the planet as well. Well, I, I, as someone who's had a fair, fairly extensive uh, exposure to broadcasting, I, I have strong feelings about these ideas, so I'm so happy to hear you expressing them as well. <laughs> good. <laughs> let's That's let's good. talk a little bit. Let's talk about a bit, if we will, about uh, Frank Herbert. Uh, excuse me. Well, I do want to talk about Frank Herbert, but before we go there, Dr. Frank yeah, Stranges. Yeah. Dr. Frank Stranges, you see, it's an, there's an interesting paradox in my mind. I'm hoping you can help bring some clarity. He, sure. He, he was a well-respected figure in the law enforcement community. That's correct. He was also a marshal. And at the same time, he was, he was an outspoken, I think he was an evangelical Christian. He was. He was brought up, uh, he was brought up and went to Bible school and Bible seminary. Uh, he went to, you know, all of those, uh, all of those things, but um, he, uh, he also was very extremely open-minded about everything. Do you know? I mean, his big things was, his big talk was UFOs and the Bible. So, so how is it that an individual could be so well-respected in the law enforcement community and at the same time be so outspoken on such a controversial subject as, as the topic of UFOs? Do you know, when you, when you meet him, um, you, you'll understand, I mean, he, he reminded, uh, he was so good and so kind, there wasn't a mean bone in his body, he never said one mean thing about towards anyone, about anyone, um, and I sort of, you know, made it a testament to his upbringing, but also to hanging out with these great people, 
you know, throughout his entire life, you know. I said, wow, you know, to just be in the energy of these loving beings and, and this uh, um, uh, energy field, you know, with them at all times. You know, they would come and visit him all the time as well, uh, you know, in his office or in his home or whatever, or sometimes he would go there. So, um, you know, but if you met him, everybody I introduce him to still to this day says how much they love him and that even even after his passing, if he met a friend of mine maybe once, that friend, and, and this happened um, I think about a year ago, about all, I had a string of friends who called me within a two-week period saying, this is so weird, but I felt Dr. Frank standing in my room, and he he was coming by to say hi, right? You know, and and I so he was sort of making the rounds to just give everybody a hello, even though he only met them once, you know, in in real life. Because I introduced him, you know, I would bring him to things. Our birthdays were one day apart, so we would always. You know, if I had my big birthday party, I'd bring him along. I say, "Okay, it's your birthday too." You know, so <laughs> you were <laughs> so very have these big, big fun birthday parties, and a big producer threw us a birthday party one year. So, what I'm hearing you say is that for those who knew him, he was a living testimony to higher teachings. Yes, absolutely, absolutely, and and so loved. I mean, just so greatly, greatly, and deeply loved. So really, that, that gives us a lot of hope to people in different careers and professions who are having interdimensional experiences or uh, yeah. phenomena in their lives, that there is there's room in the universe for this, for practical living and responsibility, as well as access yeah. to higher phenomena. Yes. yes. Well, let's go back now to uh, your work on, on Frank Herbert's Dune, because uh, you were an insider on that project for, for four years, five years? Four years from the beginning conception all the way through to the uh, uh, royal premiere in England. Well, Fra Frank Herbert was a major influence on me as a young reader. I, I was exposed to uh, one of his novellas uh, while I was recuperating from a sunburn in the South Pacific, and uh, I, my sense of the inner lives of his characters uh, was profound. Uh, reading Dune, you know, it was to me it was it, he was the uh, Tolkien of, of science fiction. He uh, yeah, yes. he, he gave shape and vision that was profound. And what what were your feelings about you know the mystical dimensions of his work and, and what was the environment like working on that film? Well, you know, I was just out of high school and um, I actually got offered the you know a job to go work on it as a production assistant. Um, that was on a Friday. I turned the job down because I didn't. I never had read Dune. I didn't even know who Frank Herbert was. I didn't know who Dino or Raffaella De Laurentiis were, and I did not know who David Lynch was. And I didn't want to do PA work. You know, I I had previously just quit at a film company from doing PA work, and I wanted to go do something different. So I turned it down. And then, you know, back then, I think, you know, you clear, like, on your paycheck, 140 bucks a week. And I went out on the weekend, and I blew it, and I didn't have a job. And they called, thank God, this lady in the office named Debbie called me back on Monday and said, are you sure you don't want the job? And I went, okay. She goes, you don't even have to interview. Just come and start work tomorrow. Uh, she says, you know, you come highly recommended. Her brother, who knew the owner of the other film company, um, is the one who suggested me. So thank God she called back because I wouldn't be sitting here talking to you today. So uh, because that's from that experience, all, you know, going into casting and everything else um, transpired from that experience. But uh but I, but I ended up working on it for four years. We also made Conan the Destroyer at the very same time, shot it at the same time. Um, we're down in Mexico City at a studio's Chair Busco. And, um, you know, and then uh, uh, the first full year was just really five of us in the office, me, David, Rafaela, and two secretaries. But does and Conan then, with Arnold Schwarzenegger? That's, yeah, that was the second one because Rafaela... And Dino had produced the first one. Then Dune, Dune was going into production. And then after about the first year of Dune in the pre-production, then uh, Conan the Destroyer went in, 
uh, also under production, both produced by Dino and Raffaella, I might add. So. Well, D Dune is a story of personal transformation and coming of age of the, the protagonist, the, uh, the the prince who has to go to go into the desert and to recover his strength to come back to yeah, lead yeah. again. I mean, it's a very powerful uh, alchemy in that story. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes when people talk about film productions, particularly uh, more, more in, in the horror film genre, they talk about things that happen on the set r related to the uh, yeah. the themes being explored in the film. Would you say there were any sort of transformational expressions uh, during that four-year period that was ha happening for the people working on that film? Well, you know, David uh, is a big transcendental meditation uh, person. So he, every, uh, every afternoon, would go shut his door. Nobody could bother him. He would just go. He would go and do his meditation, and this is what, what got him through all those, you know, I think it was something like a six-month shooting schedule. It was something more ridiculous than, you know, you can conceive. You know, to be away from your family and friends and just do shooting day after day. And then you have to remember they were out in the Juarez Desert, you know, where it was like 110 degrees when they were shooting that stuff. And those, those rubber still suits, you know, those are made of thick rubber. I mean, those people were sweating and drenched you know, in those things. Like a dry um, suit in the desert. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, there were there were those things. But there was, you know, I, I, remember, I remember the whole experience extremely fondly. David and Raffaella were such great mentors. They enjoyed doing it. I know that David, I know that Frank Herbert was so thrilled to finally have it made into a movie, you know. I had done a movie uh, with Roger Corman's wife, and um, she wanted me to re meet Roger. And Roger said, um, all right, I'll give you five minutes. That's what he said, right? <laughs> and then when I said, well, I worked four years on doing he goes, okay, you're up to a half hour. <laughs> but I didn't know as Roger owned Dune at a certain point to try and make it into a movie. Who knew? So he was very, you know, excited to, you know, to hear. But, um, you know, it was, uh, it, it was um, a really great time, you know. Uh, Jane Jenkins um, passed the film. You know, Val Kilmer was playing Paul Maud Dib up until uh, um, Elizabeth Lustig, who was Jane's uh, associate at the time. She found Kyle MacLachlan up in a little theater. She traveled all around the United States doing open calls, and she found Kyle. And, um, and uh, you know, Kyle came back, and uh, we did screen tests. Kevin Costner, before he was famous, screen tested. Val Kilmer, Lewis Smith, Michael Bean screen tested as well. Um, and Val Kilmer, uh, that's when, you know, he was just up and coming. Tom Cruise actually came in, uh, not for the screen test. He was still too young, by the way. He was about 16 or 17 when he came in to meet the producers. So, um, but he was too young. But um, anyway, I remember sitting there uh, at the screen test. Uh, I was sitting right next to Raffaella and Jane Jenkins, the casting director, was sitting on the other side, and Kyle was the last one up, and he was just chilling. He was so good. It was so evident that he was Paul Maud Dib. Raffaella, she leaned over to me and she goes, should we change his name? And I go, no, I like his name. And she goes, okay. <laughs> and that was it. You know, you know, I love that she deferred to the PA, by the way, <laughs> which was me. But, uh, but I loved her. We had so much fun. So... You know, filmmaking is full of risks, uh, financial risks, other types of risks. It can make you or break you, perhaps. Do, do filmmakers yes. seek out projects that have transformational potential? I mean, on different levels. What, what, what attracts you to a film or a project? Well, what attracts me to a film, like, you know, is, is the subject matter. You know, we all know that we take jobs for a paycheck, right? Everybody does. But then if there's something that is so spectacular... You know, um, that's why everybody came on board Stranger at the Pentagon, is because of the message and because of, you know, the, uh, the whole thing. <clears throat> you know, just, just uh, it being, you know, um, 
that bank of history that nobody wants to see go away, you know, because all those guys are gone now. You know, there's only one guy left from that era, you know, but all of the contactees from that era or have all passed away. So this is sort of like a nice homage. You know, they're even doing, uh, trying to get George Van Tassel's story. I know the ladies that own uh, the Integratron, and they've got a script, and they're trying to do that, and I think that's fantastic because his story is, is fantastic. Um, Howard and Connie Menger, also other contactees, their story's fantastic, and a lot of people don't know this, but those famous photos of Valiant Thor, he has Vice Commander Dawn and Jill, who's the wife of Vice Commander Zan, on board uh, Victor One, uh, Val's um, ship, um, were taken in the Menger backyard in Highbridge, New Jersey. Mm -hmm. So there was so, an interrelatedness between these famous personalities of that time. They weren't all that. Of that time period, yeah. Yeah, so um, interestingly. And then the photos were actually taken by a retired Air Force photographer. Well, the, the, the more I learn about um, phenomena that people are capturing today, when I look back in the past, for example, at Harb Menger's films or uh, George Adamski's 8mm UFO footage, uh, the more yeah, stunned yeah. I am to think that not only were these you know, light years ahead phenomena happening, uh, here on Earth, but in those times when we would think, you know, the society was maybe even more conservative and more, uh, you know, not as space age as we think may think of ourselves today. Those these were right. light years ahead in these people's backyards. Yeah, and you know, a, a lot of things that people don't know is that, um, you know, Gene Roddenberry himself said he knew that he was receiving these transmissions about Star Trek from beings not of this earth. He knew that, right? And here's another little tidbit people don't know, is that Lucille Ball is the one who actually was the head of RKO Studios at the time because she owned it, and after Desi stepped down and she was there, she's the one that greenlit Star Trek. Lucille Ball. Lucille Ball, how's that? And she greenlit Mission Impossible. So we all, not only do we not all always love Lucy, but, <laughs> you know, nobody knows that little tidbit. If Lucy said no, who knows if Star Trek would have ever happened. Really? So the, peop yeah. the people who came before us, they, uh, they paved, uh, they blazed these trails that, we, that, that yeah. are little known, uh, but they were trailblazers in, in all these areas that became... In all these years, yeah. 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 Absolutely. So tell us more now about Stranger at the Pentagon. Um, you, what stage is the project at now? Where what what is what is next for Stranger at the Pentagon? Well, we felt we we did our big giant green screen day. We everything is all filmed and in the can. Um, we're just going into the visual effects stage now. So we just had to do our giant visual effects manifest, and we had to put all the manifest into the actual cut of the visual effects cut for the visual effects guys. Um, so they'll be going to work and creating all of these wonderful environments that have never been seen before. Um, we already, we just got our, uh, excuse me, about a month ago, our um, Stranger at the Pentagon sort of, you know, big theme song, which, which is as terrific as a John Williams theme song. Um, and uh, so the music is now being laid, you know, to what we have of the film now. And then we just have to design our title sequence, which, uh, which we're uh, going to be starting that it will be our next uh, phase. And then uh, once the visual effects guys are all done and we put all that back in, we go back in and they're going to color correct the film. The one thing that I have always wanted to do as the director is everything that you see on Earth is going to be 1950s Technicolor. And everything on board the mothership and on board Victor One and in the universe is going to be high def, um, major, major, like you're watching the Avengers. Because, you know, we, we were able to get an epic red camera to shoot the film on, which is what they shoot all the giant movies on. You know, the Avengers, uh, I think uh, Star Trek was done on that, I'm not sure. But, um, you know, you just get this incredible quality. It's an ultra-futuristic look. Ultra-futuristic, yeah, exactly. So that we set the contrast, because what it, my, in, in, in so doing, I wanted to set the contrast of the different consciousness as well. You know, 
that this was the consciousness in that time period because when we watch movies of that time period, especially, you know, like good warm-hearted movies, you know, um, it's like going back and watching Charlie's Angels or an Aaron Spelling show from the, the 70s or 80s. You remember what it was like when you were, you know, in high school watching that film and it was a much simpler time. It was a much you know, easier time. So it's sort of like transferring that feeling over, although it's Washington and it's, you know, all about, you know, the politics of what went on during that time, uh, during Valiant Thor's three year stay. So that the movie focuses on that. Now the short film is just taking the small thread of him coming, landing, going to meet the president, meeting with the joint chiefs then going through the various steps and then we see what could possibly happen to him in the end of the short film and then there'll be you know like in the 50s uh, movies where the cards woo, you know they pop up like that you know um, you know the swipes you know with a uh, you know with a deep narrator voice you know will volume Thor <laughs> You know, it kind of has a little Marvel feel to it a little bit. You know, I say Valiant Thor is the Captain America of the universe. <laughs> this is great. Now, tell it's tell us spirituality. You know, spirituality, absolutely. Yeah. You know, this is this is this this is related to incidents from the 1960s, the late 1960s, almost four decades or over four decades in the past. What message does Valiant Thor bring to the people of today and society? It's, it's, you know what? It's still that same message. Um, even though his initial uh, message when he came here was not implemented, he used Dr. Frank um, as the tool that got it out into the public in a grassroots kind of way. Um, and Dr. Frank toured many, many countries speaking with, with giant individuals. I mean, he used to even be on stages with Werner von Braun and, you know, all of these people. Um, from that, from those eras, when he went to Korea, he filled stadiums um, like the size of Dodger Stadium of all of the Korean people who wanted to hear about Valiant Thor. I mean, that's how much the world really, really was interested in um, hearing about uh, you know this man who came from somewhere else and and you know why he came and and what he was doing here. So the message has always been the same. The main message is just simple. It's love, and it's to just treat everybody with that love. But but then if we get into the other messages like um, uh, about consciousness and about how you control your own thoughts, how you you have the power to think a thought, then you have the power to create or destroy that thought. And if you want to create a bad thought, then you are going to be responsible for how that thought grows out in your outer and inner world. And if it's a horrific deed, then you're going to have to really, really own up to all the payment that is coming from something like that. So, and if it's a good thought and it spreads out throughout the world, then all of that love and all that goodness and kindness is going to come back to you. So they're just simple, you know, simple, simple teachings and, you know, in that respect. But to also let people know that there is a, there really is a whole kingdom of these incredible beings out there who really are waiting for us on Earth to become fully conscious so we can join with that universal society and become a part of it. This is all very inspiring, and we've run out of time for tonight's show, Craig, but I, I can't say enough how, um, how good I feel having spent the last hour with you to learn about this project and, and your vision for uh, Strangers at the Pentagon and, and filmmaking and, and emerging trends. I hope that we'll have a chance to speak again as your project develops and, and, and you have more to share. Uh, it would be great to uh, have you back on the show. I would, I would love that. I'd love to come, you know, I'll come on any time and give you guys updates. That is awesome, Craig. Craig Crapabasso has been with us this evening on UFO PM. I'm your host, John Kelly. StrangerAtThePentagon.com is the website. Check it out. Learn more about Craig's work and the star crew, Valiant Thor. Uh, it sounds like a very exciting film, and if you see the reels that have been released, uh, it is visually stunning. 
This is UFO PM. I'm your host, John Kelly, and uh, we look forward to being back. Uh, we have, uh, we'll be on the road at the East Eddy Ranch in late June, and uh, there'll be a lot of amazing footage coming from there. Hope to have some updates for you and uh, some more exciting guests this summer. Stay tuned for more, and signing off for now.